Okay, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for those of us who have come here to, uh, to learn your word. And I pray as we open up the scriptures, you'll open our hearts to the scriptures and the scriptures to our hearts. Lord, please honor yourself this evening throughout the building. Amen. Okay, the rest of us were in Genesis 36. This is a unique section that we're going to be in, if we can get far enough along here. Um, when I see genealogists and things like that, I uh, like to not just run over the top of them, which many do, and I could do it too, but but I like to take a, a moment and look at people's names and, and see if I can find any characteristics or uh, uh, unique backgrounds. And, uh, and sometimes you don't. Um, but sometimes you can tell about a location or things like that by defining the, uh, the terms, okay? All right, so chapter 6. Now these are the generations or the offspring of Esau, that is Edom. Remember, Edom means red. It's a form of the name uh, of Adam. Uh, there are 12 sections that begin with these are the generations or the offspring of this man. Uh, and uh, there are 12 of those sections in Genesis with chapter 1 through about verse 3 being the introduction to, to these. Verse 2. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan and the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Okay. Um, okay. And Olhebama, the daughter of Anna, the granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite. Now, when he takes this, Ada just means to make progress. Okay. The daughter of Elon. Elon means strength. Holy Bama means the exalted uh, tent, or it could be like an occultic term, um, some kind of a sacrificial exalted uh, tent. <coughs> the daughter of Anna. Anna means intent, intense attention. Okay, I don't know if that is because that's kind of a baby she was, or, or whatever this was. Okay, and the granddaughter uh, of Zibion, the Hivite. D Zibion means diverse colors, and Hivite is just for the term for life, for life giving. Verse 3, and Basimath, which means fragrances or spices. Okay, okay, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth, which means fruitfulness. Verse 4, and Ada bore Eliphas to Esau. Now, Eliphas means the god of gold, god is gold, or the strength of gold. Okay, which tells you a little bit about his heart. Okay, and Basimath bore Ruel, which means friend of God. Now, this is probably not a friend of God as in the true living God, but probably some pagan uh, pagan God. Okay? And Holubama bore Jeush, which means hasty, and Jalam, which means occultic, things that are hidden, the occult. Okay? Hence, when I say, and when if somebody's mis mentioning God in one breath and mentioning the witchcraft and the occult in the next breath, the, the God they're mentioning is not the God of the Bible, right? Okay? There's, okay, and Jalam, there's the uh, cult, and uh, Korah. Korah means bald, okay? You see, by the way, you see in, in the Psalms, a good handful of the Psalms are dedicated to the students of Korah, or the students of uh, Asaph. It translates to sons of Korah, sons of Asaph. Asaph is a form of the name of Joseph to progress more and have more, but the sons of Korah are the students of, of bald, and, and um, when men put shave their heads bald or tore their garments and things like that, they were grieving. And uh, I'm one of his two schools that taught two different types of music is what I'm seeing in, uh, in that. But uh, maybe, okay. These are the sons of Esau that were born to him in the land of Canaan. Now Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the households and his livestock and all the cattle and all the goods which he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went to another place, okay, far away from Jacob. And the property becomes so, so great for them, too great for them, frankly, to live together. And the land that they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country, in Seir, in Esau is Edom. Okay, now we have double names, and, and sometimes cities have double names. Uh, so now these are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites. Okay, so because his name is Edom, his descendants were Edomites in the hill country of Seir, which means hair. 
Harry, okay? And I don't know if the guy's original name may have been like we use the, have the term Harry even to this very, very day. Yeah. I'm not saying it comes from right now. This. Names of Esau's sons. These are, are them. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, okay? We've had these names before. Son of Esau's wife, Ada. Ruel, the son of Esau's wife, Basman. Now, the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar. Now, Teman means the right-hander to the south. And somebody at your right hand is given honor. Okay. Omar means one who speaks. And Zepho means to observe. Gatam, meaning is unknown to me. And Kenaz, which means hunter. And verse 12. Timna means restrained. Was a concubine of Esau's son Eliphaz. And she bore Amalek, like the Amalekites. Okay. Amalek to Eliphaz. And these are the sons of Esau's wife to Ada. Now these are the sons of Ruel. Nahath means to descend or go down, okay? And Zera means to shoot out like the rays of the sun. Sunny, you could call him sunny, okay? And Shama means to stun, how stunning, okay? And Miza, which means to suck out or be exhausted, right? Verse 4, uh, Miza. Okay, these were the sons of Esau's wife, Basmeth. These were the sons of Esau's wife, Aholibama, the exalted tent, and the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion. And she bore to Esau, Yeush and Yalam and Korah. Now these are the chiefs. As we refer, I'm going to change one word in here. because When you see the word chief, it's the word bull. Okay. When I was a boy, I had a, I had a friend, and um, his father was a police officer. And he was, um, he was, at that time, people called these state police officers, they called them state bulls, right? They have a lot more power than just basic officer of a town. Uh, okay, so, and his dad was, my friend, his dad was a state bull, that kind of thing. Well, the chiefs is the word for a bull. It's LF, and it translates bull, or it translates the thousands. Somebody with, it's just lots of power, things like that, okay? And so these are the bulls. Of the sons of Esau, men or animals, and in, uh, in, in that day, it's just which is just fine. Okay, uh, our titles, by the way, are very formal titles. We call the president. President it comes from the word to preside, because he presides over things. Okay, he's not supposed to be a man of great power. He's supposed to just preside over things, keep things running. Right, Govern, governor means to govern. Senator it means it, is senex. It means old. They're old men. At least they're supposed to be, not always, kind of thing, okay? Um, a mayor just means major, more. It just means more, okay? And of course, police officers are doing the policing. They're keeping an eye on, uh, on things, etc. So this is the American term. But here, these are the bulls of the sons of Esau, okay? Now, the sons of Eliphaz were the firstborn of Esau are bull Timon, not chief. Bull Timon means the right hand or sound. And bull Omar to speak. Okay, and bull Zepho and bull Canaan's chief Korah or bull who is Korah, uh, bull Gatam and the bull Amalek, and these are the bulls descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom, men of strength, right, and power. Now, those are the sons of Adah. Now, these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, okay, bull Nahath and bull Zerah and bull Shama, the bull Miza. <laughs> Okay, these are the bulls descended from Ru, uh, Ruel in the land of Edom. And these are the sons of Esau's wife, Basmat. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Olibama, Bull Jeush, Bull Jalam, and Bull Korah. And these are the bulls who have descended from Esau's wife, Olibama, the daughter of Hanan. These are the sons of Esau, that is the sons of uh, Edom or Edom the sons of Red, and these are their bulls, chiefs or their, their bulls. Now, these are the sons of, uh, or the sons of Seir, the Horite. By the way, Horite means burning, okay, and the inhabitants of the land of, okay, Lotan means a veil or a covering, and Shobal means to overflow, Zibion is colors again, and Anna again means intense focus. Okay, 21. And Dishon, which means antelope or jumper, and Ezer, means to store up as in a treasure, a little treasure. And Dishan, 
which means a, um, a leaper or an antelope again. These are the bulls descended from the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. And the sons of Lotan were Hori, which means hot in anger, and Himam means raging, and Lotan, which means, uh, okay, we had before, and the sister of Timna, which means restrain. And these are the sons of uh, Shobal, which means to overflow, okay, uh, they are Alvan, means veiled or hidden. This could be an occultic term as well, okay, and Manahath means restful, okay, by the way, this is just like the name of Noah with the, the M put in front of it. it makes it like a, like a part of a simple type thing. And it uh, means restful. Ebal means bold, bald or bare. Okay? And Shefo means something higher, something that sticks out, prominent. And Onam means strong. Okay? Verse 24. And these are the sons of Zibion. Okay? Aya means screamer. Okay? By the way, why would you call your baby and give them the name Screamer? Why do you think? Okay. Okay. And Anna, which means paying intense attention. Okay. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zivion. Okay. Now that's quite the event. He found. He's the guy that found those things. Like, like readers are going to know what that is. Don't know where those those things are today. Okay. These are the children of Anna, Dishon, and Holbama, and the daughter of Anna. Okay. And these are the sons of Dishon. Okay. Dishon are Hemdan, means pleasant, and Eshban, means vigorous, or somebody who grows quick. Ithran, means excellent, and Keran, I do not know the meaning of. 27. These are the sons of Ezer. Bilhan means timid. Zavan means easily shaken or agitated. And again, I can see a little child being easily shaken or ag agitated. And Akan means to twist. These are the sons of Dishan. Okay. Uz to consult uh, or counsel. Okay. And Aran means a treasure chest. Okay. Now these are the bulls descended from the Horites. Bull Lotan, Bull Shobal, Bull. Uh, Zibion and bull Anna, the bull Dishon, the bull Ezer, bull Dishan. And these are the chiefs descended from the Horites, according to their various bulls in the land of, of Sihar. I gotta admit, I like that term. These are big men, powerful men. They're bulls. Okay? Now, verse 31. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Now, somebody's obviously uh, edited this in some way. It could have been Moses during his time, because this is uh, written quite a time before it. Okay? By the way, um, when you see this is the book of the generation of your descendants of, um, at one time, they were um, there was a man plowing a field, and he hit this stone in this field. And so he got, went and got an animal to try to pull the stone out of the field. Well, it was a round stone, and he pulled the top off of a hole that dropped right down into an ancient library. <laughs> okay? Incredible. And they went down there, and there are these manuscripts down there, and clay tablets and, and things, and went, went down. And so, like a library today, you have these rows of documents, and at the end of the row, you would have information of what's in that row. And one of the things that they would found at the end of the row was, this is the book of the generation of, book of generation, just like these. Okay, so what you may have is that Moses may have originally put these things together and summarized these um, these ancient documents. Okay, which ancient, ancient documents tend to get lost and destroyed. Okay, but anyway, it was a quite quite the find here. Okay, so verse thirty one. Literally, these are the kings that were kinging before a king was kinging for the sons of Israel. So whoever's writing this, he knows kings are coming, but they don't have them. Yeah, okay? Obviously, a later editor comes in, in the scene. Verse 32, Bela means a destroyer. Son of Beor, it means lamp, okay? He reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinabah. I don't know what that word means. I couldn't even find it. Lexicon, where anybody knows what it means, okay? Verse 32, verse 33, and Bela died, and Jobab, okay? The son of Zerah of Bozrah became king in his stead. Now, Jobah means a howler. 
and Basra means some, something that's enclosed, okay? And Jobab died, and Hushan, the land of the uh, Temanites, became king in his place, okay? Husham means to hasten, go fast. And verse 35, And Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad. Hadad means, it's the name of an idol, so he named after some pagan idol, okay? Son of Bedad, which means separated or alone, who defeated Midian, now Midian means brawler, in the field of Moab. Now remember the Moabites? Moab means from my Abba, from my father, as the name after Lot's daughter. King became king in his place, and the name of that city is Avath, which, strangely enough, it means perverted or twisted or crooked or wicked. Okay. And and by the way, just as um, you can find people who are named in the scriptures bizarre names, you can find cities that are named these bizarre names as well. Okay. Like Riggins, who used to be called Gaujai. Okay. Uh, sounds like some little brawling bar to me. I uh, kind of thing. No doubt that's where something like that got its original name. Okay, and you've got things like that in the scriptures themselves. And Hadad died. <clears throat> okay, and uh, Samla, which means image or likeness, the use of, term used of idols, of Masreka means a vine, became king in his place. Okay, and Samla died. And Shaul, this is a word for Sheol or the name of Saul. Okay, of uh, Rehoboth, which means streets, on the river, Euphrates is not there. Some river, okay, he became king in his, his place. And Sheol died, and Baal Hanan, now, now Baal is an old term for lord of anything, okay? If, if you were a hairy man, the Bible would call you the Baal of hair, the lord of hair. That's the term for uh, Elijah. If you have a short, uh, short temper, the Bible will call you the Baal of heat, the bale of anger, Lord of anger, right? Uh, kind of thing. And I think a little reverse because your anger lords over you. You get the idea, and that's how they would do that. So um, these bales were Phoenician deities, okay? And the word just means uh, to be Lord. Okay, <clears throat> so Baal Hanan, he's the son of Akbor, which means to swell up or become, become great, okay? He became king in his place, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar, he became king in his place. And that name of that city was Pau, which means screaming. Okay. By the way, the word ear means to scream or cry of alarm. We translate it city. But the idea is you run, if you're, if you're ambushed, you run into that city and you cry out or scream as you're going into the city and they shut the doors, right? And then other scholars would say it also means it's a screamer as in there are guards up on the ramparts keeping an eye on things. It was a dangerous time, man, right? You'll notice early in Genesis when men began to multiply, first thing they do is go to war with each other, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's, that's the heart of man is to go out and take things that belong to others. Okay, uh, you better look at our government. Why? Uh, why do they always get rich? Right? And they because they have in front, inside information. They don't have to take to take people's money. Now and then you've got good politicians who who understand some things. But but um, the idea of men of power taking advantage of, of men who aren't powerful is just it's quite common. It's all around the world. There are countries, uh, some countries you literally can't get in and out unless you're bribing the people to get in and you bribe the people to get out because uh, you don't have to do, uh, do that, right? They call it tipping according to, uh, to custom. And uh, I remember we went on the Mexico border and the missionary was talking about um, leaving certain things out because the guards like certain things. And uh, they'll pass through. And if, if not, they can search you and delay you for, uh, for hours. And uh, first time I ever went down in my ignorance, the guards came on board and they were looking and asking questions and they like, I couldn't figure out what they were asking. And so finally they were saying, you guys got some cookies? <laughs> I think, you know, and they're border guards. Uh, obviously they want some cans of cookies and packets of cookies or some things like that. And I didn't give them anything because I didn't know what they were, what they were frankly doing. And so uh, he came around in the back and opened up the back of this little bus that we were in with a group of teens. And he started to search. And so I came out with the camera and said, can I get a picture of you? And he said, no, no, no cameras at the border. And that's it. And finally, I think he just thought I was, I was dumber than a board. And so he just slammed the door and said, get out of here. <laughs> Which is what I wanted to do in the first place. 
Totally different coming back to the American side. Nobody's looking for cookies and snacks and junk food and money, I think. All right. So, Belhan, son of Akbar, and Hadar, the king, uh, Akbar, he died. Hadar became king in his place. That city is Pau. Okay? Screaming. His wife's name is Mahetabel. That means um, somebody who's better off because of God, which God is not clear in this, this text. By the way, whenever you see the word God in the Bible, don't always assume it's God of the Bible. Many gods around in those days, okay? Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, it means to drive on closer continually, okay? Daughter of Mezahav, which means he who is gold. Okay? There's 40. These are the names of the bulls descended from Esau. According to their families and their localities, by their name, Bull Timna, Bull Alva. Alva means iniquity, the man of a powerful man of, of iniquity. Uh, bull um, Jehath, which means a gift, maybe. Chief Alabama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinan. Uh, Pinan means perplexed. Uh, Chief Kinaz, Chief Timan, Chief or Bull uh, Mibzar. 43. Mibzar, by the way, means fortification. Okay. Chief Magdiel means preciousness of God. Chief Iram means a city-wise uh, or exalted city. Now, these are the bulls of Edom. That is, Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their, inhabit their habitations and the land of their possessions. Now, that's a mouthful to get through that thing. 37. Now, Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. All right, now, these are the records or generations of the descendants of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years of age. Okay? That means 11 years have passed since Jacob got back to Canaan. All right? Now, Joseph was 17 years of age when he was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, this bad report could be either a true bad report or it could just be him. Because this word that he uses for report is also the word for slander and troublemaking. Okay? And we're going to see that uh, Joseph is anything but spotless as a, as a, as a you. Okay? He's go back to tell on his, his brother. Verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a very cold, uh, colored uh, tunic. Okay? Now, tunic here is the word for a shirt or a coat or a robe. We can't tell what it is. Now, let me throw you, throw you a curve here. The word very colored is literally, it, it, it is a word that means the palm of your hand or the sole of your foot. That's all it means. It has nothing to do with color. All right? So it could be a robe that, that reaches all the way to his palms. In those days, they would have robes without sleeves. Okay, but so this could reach there, and it could also go down and reach his foot. Okay? So we can't quite tell what this is. It looks like it may be the sleeve thing, hand, foot, no colors required. So you could translate it multicolored, or you could translate it multiple kinds of cloth, diverse weaving, pieced together, a striped garment, and uh, in the 100s, the Jewish people translated it long-sleeved, okay? And the Latin Vulgate says it is wrought or tightened up with many threads. So it could be a thick garment. It could be uh, really, really nice threads and, 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 and tightly woven, okay? Now, whatever this is, and I don't know what this is, his brothers can see it and realize it is an exalted gift and an exalted position that he has, Right? He was a 17-year-old wearing something very stylish that his brothers don't have. Others believe this marks Joseph out as the future ruler, normally a place given to the firstborn. Jacob is exalting him for some reason here. Okay, Verse 4. Now, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of the brothers, and they hated him. And they could not speak to him on terms of shalom. They couldn't talk decently, couldn't hold a good conversation with him. Okay? Now, Joseph had a dream, and he was telling it to his brothers and telling it to his brothers and telling it to his brothers, which is what the Hebrew is pointing out here. He's rubbing it in. 
and they hated him even more. Okay. By the way, if he's telling his brothers and they hate him because of it, he keeps telling them, what kind of a 17-year-old is he? He's a belligerent young, young man, isn't he? He's quite belligerent here. Okay. He's rubbing it in. He's making matters worse. He said to them, you'll like this. When he says to them, the word please listen, is, please is not there. This is a command. You guys listen to me. Okay? Because it has a form of a word that means harshness or roughness. Okay? And it's a command form. Let me tell you about this dream that I had. Verse 7. Okay? Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep rose up and stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Now this is not something his brothers are going to want to hear. Literally, we're in the field and it says, we were sheaving the sheaves. And mine stood up, yours bowed down. Okay. Let us say it. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you going to rule over us? Literally, the Hebrew says, kinging, are you going to king over us and ruling? You're going to rule us? So they hated even more because of his dreams, because of his words. Okay. By the way, notice how they're interpreting this. Not because they have the gift of interpretation, because in that culture, things that rise up are above others. And they understand those sheaves represent him and it represents them. Nothing fancy going on here. Now they... He had still another dream in verse 9. He related to his brothers. He said, Lo, I have suffered... Uh, I had another dream. Oh, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now you will need to know this because of Revelation 12. Because there is a heavenly woman with the sun, moon, and the stars over her which is Israel, and he's going to explain that in just a moment. All right? In verse 9, where it says, had another dream, he related it, and he related it, and he related it. It's an imperfect tense. He just kept saying it, okay? Some of the moon and stars are all bowing down to me. And he related it, and related it, and related it. He, he presses his father, Jacob, okay, and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually bow down ourselves before you to the ground? Now Jacob has had dreams before, and Jacob can interpret those things, and he saw what was happening. So he knows that the sun is him, and the moon is his mother, and the stars are his brothers. Now remember Abraham's promise was his descendants would be like the stars. Remember? So he understood Jacob and stars, that's your brothers. What are you doing? Okay. Verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father, this is the word he guarded these sayings, or this word in his mind. Okay. Jacob did not turn loose of this. He held on to this because he... Um, he had already learned in the other land and on the way to Bethel and fleeing from his brother that uh, God provides dreams and those dreams can come true. Okay? And he sees that with his brothers. His brothers don't know, know what's going to happen, but, but Joseph is going to realize this when he is ruling over Egypt and his brothers come and bow down to him. And he will know this. Okay? So then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are you and your brothers passing, are not your brothers pasturing the flock which is in Shechem? Okay. By the way, Shechem means um, it means shoulder. Okay. Uh, so you can load an animal, you put things upon a Shechem, upon his shoulders, his, his pads, etc. Okay. It can also mean early, that is the early part of the turn. So my guess is that this is a city set up on the part of a hill that's curved. Catch the morning sunlight, right? Shechem. Incline. Israel says to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. He said to them, Okay, then I will go. And then he said to them, Go now and see about the welfare, see about the shalom of your brothers and the shalom of the flock and bring back word to me. And so he went to him in the valley of Hebron. Uh, Hebron means to cast a spell, charms and chants, uh, obviously named after the occultic practices of that day. So he came to Shechem, 
And a man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have moved from here. I heard him say that let's go down to Dothan. The only thing I can tell you about Dothan is it's Aramaic and the ending is, is a dual, I mean double or two of them. And I don't know what the rest of it, uh, of it means. Okay. Um, usually when I say I don't know what it means it's because I couldn't find it in lexicons or any, you know, I have a handful of lexicons that I consult and none of them have anything to offer here. Okay. All right, so Joseph went down uh, after his brothers. He found them at Dotham. They saw him from a distance before he came close to them, and they plotted. Now, this word for plotting is a word to defraud or treachery against him to put him to death. Okay? I'm going to kill this boy. And they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Here comes this by the way, a dreamer. Literally, here comes this bale of dreams, this lord of dreams. Look, look at him coming. Now then, come and let us kill him. Kill is a poor word. It's a word for just, just violent murder. Okay? Let us kill him, throw him into one of the pits. And we will say that a, a bad animal, a wild beast, has devoured him. Then let us see what becomes of this guy's dreams. But Reuben, he heard this. Reuben is their firstborn. And rescued him out of their hands, and he said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit that is uh, in this wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. And he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. That's some rather noble about Reuben, even though we know from Reuben's past he's not a noble guy. You know, there are, there are bad men in this world that still have a sense of right and wrong and morals, and they know. They may be bad men, but they, but they know. 23. It came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they, they spread him out, is, is the term here. They spread him out and stripped Joseph of his tunic, of whatever that was, a special tunic that was on him. And they took him and they threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water of it, water in it. It could be a dry pit as in a well or something like that. We do not know. Um, in the Psalms, you will see the, the Psalmist will talk about being down in the pit. Others are thrown into the pit. Jeremiah is thrown into the pit. It seems like a, a common practice in that day. So they sat down to eat a meal. And they raised their eyes and behold a caravan of Ishmaelites. Okay, was coming from Gilead. Now, Gilead means a heap of witness or testimony. Ishmaelites are also called, in this very passage, in just a second, they're going to be called Midianites. Okay, and so double terms being used for these guys. And, uh, of course, the Ishmael, we know who that is. And the Ishmaelites, these are traders, wandering traders, and they're intermarrying with traders and travelers, etc. And they are on their way down to Egypt, the land of double oppression or double slavery. Okay. And they're taken with Ishmaelites. They're coming with, from Gilead with the camels bearing aromatic gums and balm and myrrh on their way down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's just sell him. <laughs> Remember, the scriptures are about us. J Joseph will be a type of, of, the, of the Messiah. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listen to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, and some of the Israelites, they passed by, I don't know if they broke off in the main column or said what they were doing, and they pulled him up and lifted Joseph up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels or measures of silver. And they bought Joseph into Egypt. Now this was a common price for slaves in those days, and trading slaves was quite common in their days. You know, 20 shekels. That's two shekels a boy they got for their brother for selling him. Later on, Judas will do it for 30, 30 pieces of silver. Okay. My goodness. Verse 29. Now Reuben returned to the pit. It was the first one. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments. And he returned to his brothers. He said, the boy is not there. As for me, 
where am I going to go? And I'm not quite sure it means to, like that. Am I in charge and i got to give account to dad and I don't know what to do or where do I look for him? I'm not quite sure what he means by that. So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. They sent the very colored tunic and they brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. He examined it and he said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Let me ask you something. Right before Jacob fled from his brothers, what did he just do to his father? He went to Isaac, lied to him, and deceived him. What are these boys doing? They've gone to their father, lied to him, and they're deceiving him. Okay. Remember, Abraham used to tell these lies about his wife, and then Isaac get it, and it's going downstream through this family. Okay. So Joseph or Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins, and he mourned for his son many days. Verse 35. All his sons and his daughter arose to comfort him. He refused to be comforted. Literally, refused is a term to, he just hunkered in on himself and, and shut himself down and wouldn't, wouldn't let them in. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol, the place of the dead, in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, sold him into Egypt to Potiphar. Okay. Potiphar means either the one whom the god Ra has given, he's truly Egyptian, or the one who is placed on earth by Ra, making this some kind of a, it's more than just his name. Pharaoh's officer, and Pharaoh means the house. Remember, Moses will write, God has brought you up out of the house of bondage. I think it's a play off Pharaoh's name. Okay? And he's the captain of the, the word bodyguard is literally, he's captain of the butchers, the slaughterers. Bodyguard sounds very nice in English, but in the Hebrew text, literally, they are the butchers. They're men of danger. Don't come near this man without being bidden to come near to him. Okay. Now, it came about at that time that Judah, he departed from his brothers, visited a, a certain Adulamite, what the meaning is unknown, but his name is Hira, means white with splendor. And Judah saw there the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, which means like freedom that noble men have. Okay? And, Shua. and he took her and he went into her. Now notice what he's doing. He's ready to integrate into the Canaanite culture, marry and, and live there and uh, get along with them. Okay? Now she conceived and she bore a son and his name was Ur. Now Ur is a form of a watched over city. And she conceived again, she bore a son and named him Onan, which means strong. And she bore still another son and, and they named him uh, Shelah, or Shelah, which means a request or a petition. So evidently they were requesting, hoping for the child. Okay, And it was at Kezib that she bore him. Now Kezib means lying, failing, or falsifying. I don't. Why would you name that place that way? Not quite sure. Maybe a business deal fell through there. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar, meaning palm tree. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of Yahweh, so Yahweh took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife, perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up seed or offspring to your Brother, this is kind of what we call a Leverite marriage. Not Levite, but Leverite. All right? You have an obligation to go in. This is taught in Israel, but it was the culture of that day. Um, and by the way, in a, in a day when you need people, right? The earth is not really highly populated, but you need a lot of people. And, and um, there's a nobility about, about raising up the dead man's name, and that child carries his daddy's name, not yours, Right? Uh, and, so, and it goes on, so his line goes on, okay? Go into your brother, perform your duty. You know, we're duty here. This is expected of you in this world and in this culture. It is expected of this. 
Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so it came about when he went into his brother's wife, he spilled or wasted his seed on the ground in order to not give offspring to his brother. Okay? Now, in Deuteronomy 25, this is, this is frowned upon, and is, even in Israel. It's not a good thing to do, okay? And this is, uh, you, you become like a kinsman redeemer, as it were, and you can see this spout played out in the book of Ruth. I'm sure we're not, we may not get to that tonight, but, but that's where you see it in its fullness here. And he did what, it, what was displeasing in the sight of Yahweh, so to, he took his life also. Now, Judah's going to think it's not Yahweh. He's going to think it's this woman. These guys are dying because of her. Now these guys are dying because of you and your paganism, your pagan boys. Okay? Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, palm tree, remain a widow in your father's house. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> okay, until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid this he might die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now, after considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the um, time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to the sheep shearers at Timnah. Now, Timnah means a phantom, and embodies some kind of a demonic spirit manifestation, so it's a cultic place. Okay, and with his friend Hira of the Adulamite. And was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Now, so she removed her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat at the gateway of Enayim. Now, Enayim is rather interesting. Notice the word veil is just a word for a, a wrap. Okay, and then she wrapped herself with this veil, so it's not just a veil, it's a huge garment. And she sits at the entrance of Enayim, which means two eyes or two wells. Okay, this is similar to the witch of Endor. This is the idea of an occultic location. We'll see that here in a second. Uh, she's con they will see her as a temple prostitute, kind of thing, uh, etc. So this is a place where you would go to practice the occult, okay? Like the witch of uh, Endor, an occultic location, okay? And so she's dreamt, dressed as a temple prostitute on the road to Timna, because she saw that Sheila was not uh, was growing up and she had not been given to him for a wife, because this is what would have been done. Do you remember Naomi told Ruth, are you going to wait for, I'm, going to have, I'm an old woman, I'm not going to have any kids, you're going to wait for the kids to grow up? You, you can't do that, verse 15. Now when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, a harlot, a zona, okay, because she was, had covered her, her face. So he turned aside. I think she knows him pretty well, doesn't she? Okay. By the way, Whenever the time was of harvest and shearing of sheep and things like that, in these pagan cultures, that was the time of grand partying and grand immorality. Okay, okay so he says, Here now, let me come in to you. And he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. Now she, she is way more righteous than he is because she has a right to this. And she said, What will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, Therefore, I will send you a kid from the flock, baby goat. Okay? And she said, Moreover, will you give me a pledge until that was there? Okay? By the way, in Canaanite culture, it required three points of identification. That's what he, for a pledge, and that's what he's going to give to her. Now notice, he's after pleasure, she's after a baby. He said, What pledge will you give me? He said, Use your seal, your cord, and your staff in your hand. So he gave it to her. She went and went into her, and she conceived by him. Now, this the word for pledge is the word Arabon. We can see that in Ephesians, where it cites Arabon from, I think, from these texts, right? His seal or signet ring, okay, that cord, it can be a twine like a bracelet, or it can be a cylinder worn on a piece of twine around your neck, okay? And it would be your, his, his seal. And the staff or walking stick has evidence of that owner written upon it. So... Ugaritic literature, Ugaritic was Canaanite, which required that of him. Okay? So she rose, departed, removed her veil, and put it on, the, on her widow's garments. When Judas sent the kid by his friend, the Adulamite, to receive the place from the woman's hand, he didn't find her. He asked the men of that place, where is that temple prostitute who was here on the road at Anayim? 
But they said, there's been no temple prostitute here. You'll like this. He asked, where is, Kodesh means holy. If you put an A on the end, it makes it female. Where is the Kodesha, that holy woman? And now notice, in those days, a temple prostitute is not seen as a low-class woman. She's, she's a temple prostitute. She's holy. Okay? This, this was rampant. And, and they had temple prostitutes with males as well. And they called them dogs. Okay? Where is that, that holy, holy gal who's a prostitute? So <clears throat> he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. Furthermore, the men of that place said, There's been no temple prostitute, no holy woman here. And Judah said, let her keep them, lest we be becoming a laughing stock. I mean, a couple of guys walking around looking for a temple prostitute is going to be a little embarrassing. Okay. After all, I did send the kid, and you didn't find her. It was about three months later. Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot. Behold, she's with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Doesn't he sound noble? It was while she was bearing or being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man of whom these things belong. And she said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff these are. I find that fascinating that, that uh, bring around and be, be burned. Um, it used to be, you go back a hundred years ago, if, if you got pregnant, you would drop out of school. A woman would not go to school being pregnant. He would not do that because, and not being married, it would be a disgrace to her. When I was uh, in like in junior high level, I didn't see that, but in high school I did, and and it was really strange to see that. But there was still a little bit of standoffish if a woman's pregnant outside uh, outside of this, because she was seen as uh, somebody who was going to be on the public dole and welfare and that that pat pattern. So it was not a well accepted thing. And to, today, if she gets pregnant out of outside of Outside of that, the government will give her a check and an apartment and food. And everybody gathers around here and they're so excited about it, this baby that's coming. And there's no shame. There's no shame. Here, there's at least shame among Canaanites. My goodness. Okay? Examine. See so who these things are. Judah recognized them. He examined them and said, oh my goodness. She's more righteous than I in as much as uh, I did not give her my son Shelah. And he did not have relationships with her again. It came about the time when she was giving birth. Behold, there were twins in her, her womb. You, the word, you like the word twin. It means it's Thomas. Now, when I see the word Thomas in the New Testament, the disciple, I know something about what I know about him. He's a twin to somebody. Moreover, it took place that while she was giving birth, one of, the, one of these babies put out his hand. And the midwife took and she tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about, he drew his hand back in, and behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach or a breaking, bursting out, you have made for yourself. So he, his name is Perez, breach or bursting out. After that, his brother came out, who had a scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah, to shoot forth, as in shooting forth his hand. Okay? Now, the next story is going to go back to Joseph. In just a minute, too, I'm going to read this to you here. We need the book of Ruth to understand how, how this works, okay? Uh, Ruth and Naomi. Naomi and her husband uh, moved to a foreign land over by the Moabites. All the men died, and she comes back. Yeah, she had two daughter-in-laws. One stays put, and the other comes back, and that's Ruth. All right? She goes out to harvest uh, or glean in a field of Boaz. When Naomi finds about it, she says, oh, my goodness, He's a, he's a redeemer. He's a kinsman redeemer. He can do this, right? Because kinsman rede redeemers were, 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 are limited to like a brother-in-law or an uncle, right? So it's very limited. But she realizes what this is, and he decides he will marry her and redeem her. And th that redeems the lamb back to Naomi, and it gives uh, Ruth a child, but the child born to Ruth will bear the name of her dead husband. So that's what takes place. Now, this is Ruth chapter 4, verse 11. All the people that were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses that may Yahweh grant the woman who is coming into your home to be like Rachel and Leah. All those kids, right? Both whom built the house of Israel. 
And so you shall achieve excellence in Ephrathah and shall proclaim your name in, in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez. That's Perez, right? Whom Tamar bore to Judah. Okay? Through the seed which Yahweh will grant to you through this woman. Great things happen through this Tamar, right? God took something bad and made good come out of it. Isn't that incredible? Right? Christianity is very messy, isn't it? How in the world is the church still going? But the church is still going. Now, it goes on. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. He went into her. And Yahweh granted her conception. She gave birth to a son. And then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a kinsman redeemer today. And may his name be proclaimed in Israel. And his name, Jesus, will be proclaimed. May he also be a restorer of your soul, a sustainer in your old age, because your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, put her in her bosom, and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. Did you catch that? A son has been born not to Ruth, to Naomi. She gets her child back. The name is restored of her of Ruth's husband. So they named him Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David, King David. Okay. Now watch this. In Deuteronomy, he says, No one born of fornication, and this is the case here, is to enter into the assembly of the Lord for ten generations. Ruth chapter 4, verse 8. These are the generations of Perez, who fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Abinadab. Abinadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Ovid. Ovid fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So David's grandparents and his line was banned from the, joining the assembly until David came along in his back. See it? He, so this book is about uh, that book of Ruth. It's about the kinsman redeemer, God restoring the dead man's name and his life and his line will go on. Okay, And a picture, because Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He gives up his life to restore yours and mine. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for our time. Thank you for your wonderful word. To see how you bring good things out of horrible messes. If only you could do such a thing. The rest of us would have rolled up our hands and folded our hands and say no more. But thank you for your patience with such people as us. In your name, amen.